It's October 6th, 2001, and we're all at the home of Mary Jane and Will Knights, celebrating her 75th birthday, which was really three weeks ago. But in honor of this birthday and this occasion, we are going to do a videotape and let her talk about her life and have all of the grandchildren and children who are here ask her questions, and she's got pictures. And this will be the life story of Mary Jane Minor Hanson Knights. Grandma, where were you born? I was born in Long Beach, California. And we were, I was, well, I was born in the hospital there. And my mother and dad had moved to Long Beach from Utah. And they kind of built our house one room at a time. So it was very small. In fact, my mother said the bedroom, their bedroom was so small she had to stand outside the window to make the bed. <laughs> Isn't that funny? And later they added more rooms and more rooms. And we had a big, huge tree out in our backyard, and we loved to climb the tree. And then when I was four, my father built a new house for us, and it was really fun. It was across the street from a golf course, and it was just through the block from a big body of water called the lagoon. And across the street behind those people's house, there was a big sump hole where they used to have an oil well, but the oil well was all gone, but there was big concrete walls all around. And all the men, the dads in the neighborhood got together and they built a tennis court and a badminton court. And we had a ladder we walked down to get into it and we could play tennis all day. It was really fun. And we loved to swim. And when I was about your age, my mother said, now you won't go out over your head, will you? And I said, Mother, I've been swimming clear across the lagoon all summer. <laughs> I didn't really know how to swim. I just kind of dog paddled. But we had a whole neighborhood full of kids, and it was so much fun. I'm so glad you're my great-granddaughters, Ashley and Megan Mills. I love you both. It's fun to have you here for my birthday. What do you like to do best? What do you like to do best? You like to draw pictures, don't you? And read books. Thank you for coming to my birthday party. Here's your best friend. We had a whole neighborhood full of fun kids that we played with. And we had a clubhouse. And we'd all have fun in the clubhouse. And we called our club the Scanty Wanty Panties Club. <laughs> and we just wore shirt, shorts. And one day my mother said, Mary Jane, I think you ought to wear a t-shirt this summer. I didn't know why, but I wore a t-shirt because my mother said I thought she thought I ought to. But we just played with all the kids in the neighborhood. Didn't matter what age they were. We all got together and played. What was your nickname? My nickname was Mike. There was a man who was a, a neighbor through the block, and his name was Mr. Jennings, and he was a fireman. So he'd work three days, and then he'd have three days off. And I went over to their house to play with his son, Eddie, and Jean, and his daughter a lot. And, and, one, and, and then I'd watch him carve things out of wood in his garage in his workshop. And I hung around there so much that he just called me his little brown-eyed boy named Mike. And one day he gave me a pair of blue jeans for my birthday. And nobody then wore blue jeans like they do now. But I wore mine to school and I was in the second grade. And my sister was older and she was in the sixth grade and she worked in the principal's office. And she was just thought it was terrible that her little sister showed up to school in blue jeans. But I thought they were special because Mr. Jennings had given them to me. Daddy yes, my daddy was an electrician. And when he went to build our new house, I went with him. And I was about your age. I guess I was about Ashley's age. And I'd go to the new house and help daddy wire the house. And they had little boxes 
that I guess they were switch boxes, and they had little round things that would poke out of the holes, and I called them pennies. And I went all over the house and picked up all the pennies out of the switch boxes. And I had a lot of pennies out of our new house. Moho, my team, my daddy work. Yes, while daddy worked, my mommy stayed home. And she took care of us. I had a brother, Doug, who was nine years older than I was. I have a, a sister, Barbara, who's four years older than I am. And then I have a little sister, Doris. There were four of us. And sometimes Grandma stayed with us, my dad's mother. We had a nice household full of people. It was fun. What's your favorite games, Grandma? We played lots of games. We drew hopscotch on the sidewalk. Have you played hopscotch? We did jump rope. Sometimes we tried to see how fast we could go. And sometimes we had a big, long rope, and two people were turning it, and someone else was jumping in the middle, and we sang little songs while we were doing it. And as we grew older, we played baseball in the, in the street, because ours was a kind of a dead-end street with a lot, a lot of traffic. And we'd play hide-and-seek, and we'd play run-sheep-run. And then indoors, we had lots of board games, you know. With, and we'd play checkers, and we'd play parcheesi, and all those kinds of fun things. Lots of family games. I was sick. Yes, one time I had the mumps. And I was in the first grade, and it was just after the earthquake, and we were meeting outside the school because we couldn't get back inside the school after the earthquake. We were meeting out on the picnic tables. But I didn't go to school. I stayed home with these big, swollen cheeks. And my mother was canning strawberries, and I love strawberries, but I couldn't eat one because it hurt too much. But my mother always took good care of me. Do you want to see a picture of what I looked like? when I was three years old. And then another th game we played was some friends of ours had a barn. And so we got together with a bunch of friends my age and we joined the Horseshoe Club. And we met in the barn and I took the minutes of the Horseshoe Club. And they're all in this little book. It was a fun group of friends. Peggy was one of my dearest friends. Grandma, what junior high school did you go to? Lily, it's so fun to have you here. This is Lily Smith. We call her Han Smith. <laughs> She's Carol's daughter. I went to Will Rogers Junior High School in Long Beach. And it was a brand new junior high school that it had just opened. And so they decided on the name of Will Rogers, who was a movie star and a kind of a cowboy. And they, uh, they had a contest to see who would give the talk at the dedication of the junior high school. And I was selected. So I gave this talk on why I like the name Will Rogers for my junior high school. And Will Rogers had passed away by then, but his son came and talked at the same program I talked at. And it was really fun. The man who was in charge, I guess, was a little nervous, and he introduced me as Mary Jane Rogers. <laughs> I got a kick out of that. But junior high was fun. Lots of sports. We played vo volleyball. And then, of course, around our neighborhood, we still went swimming in the lagoon. And we played golf across the street. We'd go over and play three holes after everybody else had finished and uh, lots of tennis and badminton, and it was a good time. Were you involved in any, like, after-school activities, like Girl Scouts or something, and did you go to camp? Uh-huh. I was a brownie, and then I was a Girl Scout, and then I was a mariner. I loved Girl Scouts, and I loved going to camp, and here's a picture of my camp counselor. Her name was Virginia Pine, but we called her Piney. And we went to the Camp of the Owls, and I just loved it. We made all kinds of beaded things, and it was really a neat experience. I loved it. When we went into Mariners, then we learned to do boating. And we lived right there near the 
the Marine Stadium where they did a lot of crew races and stuff. And uh, so we we went out in a sailboat and we learned how to switch the sails back and forth and how to jig back and forth to make the boat go. And we learned a lot about starboard and port and fore and aft and all the boat terms. And that was just as a little bit older than a Girl Scout. It was fun. Cool. Um, what... Sorry. What, like, what was it like living at your house? Our house was neat. Uh, this is a picture of our house, the one that Dad built and the one that I helped him. Uh, he did the electrical on this, and it was kind of a Spanish house with a tile roof. And like I say, it was close in to all of these wonderful things in Long Beach. It was just a wonderful place to grow up. I loved it. And... Uh, I didn't always have a bedroom to myself. I had to share with my sisters. At one time, all three of us were in one bedroom when Grandma stayed with us. And uh, we, one time we took string and we cordoned off which areas were ours. You know? <laughs> this was my father's mother, Evelyn Brown Miner Christensen. She was a widow and, and twice, and, and she came to live with us in her elderly years sweet lady um would you like to have raised your kids in a neighborhood like the one you grew up in oh yes we had everything all of the you know the golf and the tennis and the and the swimming and and wonderful schools and wonderful neighbors great neighborhood with lots of kids in the neighborhood that we all had good friends with it was great good okay did you ever play a musical instrument? <laughs> I took a lot of piano lessons. The first teacher I have was had was somebody that my mother thought needed the money, and so she had me take from her, but it was a bad experience. When she'd count, she'd kind of spit. One, two, three, four. <laughs> I didn't do very well with her. But I really loved piano, and so when I got into high school, I took from a wonderful teacher, and she did really well with me, and I did well with her. I loved it. And then I kept taking lessons after I was married to Grandpa Bob, because he played the violin, and he wanted me to accompany him. And I took from a lady named Ruth Houck, who was one of our good friends. And Ruth really encouraged me. She'd say, now, Mary Jane, anybody that can water ski like you can, can, can play the piano, you know. And so she was trying to encourage me. And I got so I could accompany Bob on Ave Maria and a few s slow things, you know. But I never did really get past the point where you're reading the notes and counting all the time. I didn't, it didn't flow with me. But I loved it, and I, I wish I could play better than I do. But it's good to have musical experience. Did you ever go see a favorite performer in concert when you were young? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, in high school, I really had an interest in music, and I went to the operas and, and the ballets and all the things that went on in the Long Beach Civic Auditorium just with some friends, you know. It was neat. And then uh, Grandpa Bob loved violin, and so we'd go hear all the famous violinists, Yehudi Menuhin and and uh, Isaac Stern and all the good ones. One night we were at a violin concert and sitting two rows ahead of us was Jack Benny who also liked to play the violin. And uh, now Grandpa loves to play the organ and so we go and hear all the famous organists. I love concerts. Did you ever study a foreign language? Yes, I did. <laughs> I took high school Spanish which was really good because they spoke Spanish in Southern California so much. In fact, we lived in La Cañada, which is a Spanish word, and there was Tijuana and all those. So we needed to know how to pronounce Spanish things. Then I went to college, and I took French, four years of French. The first year, I answered several of the questions on the test in Spanish. <laughs> but the teacher gave me credit because she knew I was thinking in a foreign language. She was nice. Then I met Grandpa Will, and uh, he spoke German, and I thought, I better learn a little German. So I went to night school, 
and took a couple of German classes, but I never did re- get really good at German or French or Spanish. <laughs> but it's fun to know a little bit of each. Okay. Um. Did science or math come hard to you? Yes. In one of these books, my report cards <laughs> that I'd saved all these years, and uh, I got A's and B's in everything, but we noticed that uh, chemistry, C, C, C. <laughs> I liked English a lot and, and majored in English when I went to college because I like to write, and I love good literature. I love poetry. And what other kind of classes did you take that you liked? Uh, I had to take physics, and I didn't want to take physics, but they they let me take photography <laughs> to get credit for that, so I did. Uh, I, I just I just loved English and loved to write. I had a few things published over the years. Uh, the dental hygiene magazine asked for uh, cute stories from the dental office, and so uh, I wrote about a patient I had who uh, sat down in the in my dental chair when I was going to clean his teeth and and he didn't say anything when I said hello and and I said open wide and finally he went opened his mouth real wide and he had a plastic spider on his tongue and I went ah <laughs> and he said don't tell Dr. Chipman and so I cleaned his teeth and then Dr. Chipman came in to examine him and he was sitting there you know and Dr. Chipman said open wide and he went and showed him that, and Dr. Chipman went, ah! And I thought this was really neat for a little boy to get two adults with one spider, <laughs> plastic spider. So I wrote that up, and it was published in the Dental Hygiene Magazine. <laughs> and then one time I wrote an article for the church magazine, The Ensign, and it was about um, divorce. And um, somebody had asked me to write that because I had been through it and experienced it and, and had, had come through. <laughs> I made it. And uh, then just the other day, I wrote an article for the um, newspaper, and it was published in the letters to the editor about po- po- positive politics. I don't like negative politics. I like positive politics. So... I've had a few things published over the years. It's been fun. Thank you for coming, Lily. You are precious to me. You know what my fondest memories are? Is when you came to stay with me every Wednesday before you started school. And we had so much fun here reading books and coloring and doing things together. And as we walked up the stairs, we'd learn to count. One, two, buckle my shoe. You remember that? Yeah. <laughs> and all those fun <laughs> Epaminondas books and all these fun things we did together. I love you dearly. I love you too. Thanks for coming. Hi, Keith Allen. Good to have you here. Nice to have you come from Palo Alto. Yeah, thanks. To celebrate my birthday. Uh huh. How old are you now? I'm 16. Wow. And you got your driver's license? Yeah. Way you go. Wonderful. Thanks. And what grade are you in? I'm a junior in high school. Oh, I forgot you're interviewing me. Okay. <laughs> what do you want to ask me? Uh, yeah, about your cheerleading days. What was that like? Oh, that was fun. It was my freshman year at BYU, and uh, we'd always had cheerleaders in high school with the pom-poms and doing the rah-rah-rah things, and they didn't have those at the Y. So my roommate, uh, Marge Hart, who was also from Long Beach, she and I made some blue and white pom-poms, and we went and tried out for cheerleader, but no one else was trying out, so of course we won. (laughs) We cheered at the football games, and we cheered at the basketball games, and we made our own uniforms out of blue skirts and white sweaters, and we just had a lot of fun with it. (laughs) Now they always have cheerleaders at the BYU games, so we started something. So have have you always been a fan of cars or your old cars or <laughs> cars? No, Grandpa was the car fan. Oh. <laughs> but uh, first time I had to put gas in myself, it was twenty nine cents a gallon. That tells you how long ago it was. Man, you're lucky. Man. Yeah, and uh, 
we had some fun cars over the years. First car I bought for myself was a stick shift, and I didn't know how to do it. But my kids said, well, just try it, Mom. In about two weeks, it'll be an automatic shift. And it was. <laughs> okay, uh, who taught you to drive? My mother. <laughs> and she wishes she hadn't. <laughs> I can still see her. We were on this little road in, in Long Beach, and it was a very quiet. It wasn't a busy street at all. And she, she asked me to make a left-hand turn, and I was going, you know. <laughs> it was hard on her. Were you ever intimidated by driving? No. <laughs> no, I loved it. it. Yeah, I loved it. Same. Uh, were you ever tempted to get a motorcycle? Uh, when we were at Lake Arrowhead one summer, there was a young man who had a motorcycle. He was the brother of Dick Smith, Dick um, uh, Anderson that lived up there, the dentist. And uh, he had taken this motorcycle from Utah to Southern California to spend the summer. And he wanted to date my daughter, Carol. And he wanted to take her to the movies and stuff on this motorcycle. And I said, no way. Don't any of you girls ever get on a motorcycle. I like you alive. And, and this kid said, get on, MJ, and I'll show you how nice it is. So I got on behind him on the motorcycle. And he said, put your arms around me. And I did. And he went, vroom, vroom. And I hugged him real tight. And he says, see why I do that? To get the girls to hug me. <laughs> and then he took me down the streets of Lake Arrowhead. And they're all windy paths. And every time we'd go around a corner, you know, we were just about going sideways. And I said, no way, let me off of this thing. We went back home. And I said, I'm convinced, girls, never get on a motorcycle. <laughs> okay, um, did you ever have a doll? Yes, my, my Shirley Temple doll was my favorite. Oh, Shirley really? Temple was the big thing in those days. I gave that doll to Lily. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Do we know if she still has it? Mm, yes, yeah. she does. That's cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, what did you do for fun when you were a kid around where you lived? Oh, we talked about that earlier. We went swimming in the lagoon. We played golf in the golf course across the street. We'd go around and play three holes after everybody had left at night. And uh, then we had this tennis court and badminton court that was all ours for the neighborhood. It was great. Thanks for coming. No. You're a great grandson. Yeah. No, I'm you're just a grandson. <laughs> yeah. glad I, I'm glad I could come too. Thank you. Happy Love birthday. You. Thank you. This is Elliot Smith, Han Smith, <laughs> and he's one of my boys because uh, I got him every Wednesday when his mother was uh, and dad were working, and, and I had Wednesdays off from dental hygiene, and he'd come and spend the day with me, and I, I loved it. That was fun. That was cool. We learned a lot of things together, <laughs> didn't we? <laughs> yeah, I remember that. That was cool. Did you learn to count going up the stairs? One, two, buckle my shoe. Three, four, close the door. <laughs> when we got to nine, ten, and he'd say, big, flat, smackaroo. <laughs> I don't remember that. That's don't pretty you? funny. Yeah, that's cute. I remember the the cookie jar really well, like how it was happy on one side and sad on the other. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> we well, had to keep that cookie jar happy and full, didn't yeah. we? <laughs> Yeah, and yeah. Grandpa loved to have you draw because you were such a good drawer. Mm -hmm. That was fun. And you drew dinosaurs and all kinds of fun things with Grandpa. Yeah. Fish. And... Dogs. That was fun. Yeah. All right. Um, what recipe are you famous for? Oh, I don't know. Maybe the one passed down from my grandmother and my mother, which is Ebel Skeever's. Ebel Skeever's. You Those are really so? good. Yeah, um, a little round. Yeah. Cakes um, that we had for Christmas always. Have you ever been to a World's Fair? Yes. Um, when your mom was little, and I could look that up, it's the, it was the, uh, was it 62? Yeah, anyway, 62. It, it was up in Washington State, Seattle. Oh, yeah. And we went up the Space Needle. We waited forever. <laughs> In fact, Bob would take the girls and go play while I stood in line and waited so to get up the Space Needle. But we just had a great, really great time, and we went into Canada, and we rode the tram down Mount Shasta, Shasta, and we just did a lot of fun things on that trip. It was neat. That's interesting. 
because we went on a trip like that a little while ago. Too. Did you? Sounds cool. Where did you go? Uh, same place, Seattle, and then up through oh. British Columbia and Vancouver. Uh huh. Isn't it a beautiful country? Yeah, did I you go it. to Bukert, Bukert Gardens? Yeah. Uh huh. That was really cool. Yes. And had high tea. Yeah. Yes, we loved that. All right. Uh, do you have any fond childhood memories of Christmas morning? Oh yes, we had uh, carpeting. We the the tree was always in front of the big window in the living room, and we had carpeting that had a pattern on it. Mm -hmm. And so we would always measure on the pattern how far the gifts went out. Yeah. <laughs> See if this Christmas was farther out than the Christmas before. <laughs> and it was fun. That's pretty funny. Yeah. One, t one Christmas when I was in high school, I came home from doing Christmas caroling with a bunch of kids. And everybody was asleep. And the stockings were hung by the chimney with care. And I went over and felt in the stop in my stocking to see what was in there. And it was a little square box with the ring I had wanted in it. And I was so disappointed that I knew the night before. Oh, and yeah. I hadn't waited until Christmas morning. <laughs> it doesn't pay to fudge. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, um, let's see. Oh, yeah. Uh, did you have a hard time getting to sleep? At Christmas night? Yeah, yeah sometimes yeah. I did. I was excited. Uh, have you ever had anything published? Yes, yes. We talked about that a little oh, bit. sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, let's see. How about... Uh, which public buildings do you use? Which public buildings? Library, swimming pool. I tried court. to stay out of jail. Yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah, I went to the library a lot. I could walk down about two blocks and catch a bus, which would take me clear downtown in Long Beach to the big library there. And I'd stay till it closed at 9 o'clock at night and then take the bus back. And I lived in a very safe neighborhood. So it was easy for me to do that all by myself, even at night. Hmm. I loved the library. It wasn't bad to take the bus? What? It wasn't bad to take the bus? No, it was very safe. Let me tell you about my high school 50 years later. Mm. My high school was several buildings all built in a circle. The science building and then, you know, and so on, administration. And then in the center was this open space, which we called the area where you soch, you know. Soch, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, it was the big thing then to have a keychain and the guys would go this way as they soched. <laughs> With the keys on the keychain. Anyway, and then the people upstairs would throw uh, water... <laughs> water balloons? <laughs> ...down on the people who were soaching. Yes. That was the worst thing that happened when I was in high school. Really? Okay. Fifty years later, I went back to the reunion. And we could, you know, earlier we could walk in. When I was going, we could walk between buildings and get into the quad and whatever we wanted to go to. Fifty years later, I went to my reunion, and the whole area was all marked off with a steel fence that had this kind of stuff, and it was uh -huh. completely locked. Yeah. We had to go around and go in through the front door of the administration building, and inside the door was a table, and the lady checked off the kids as they came and went. Did they I have metal detectors? Oh, I don't know. They didn't do it on us, but... That's crazy, because I heard, like, some California schools are doing that now. Probably so now. This was before Columbine, so yeah. probably since yeah. then. But there was a student wanting to leave as we entered that day, and the, and this person at the door with the table and the lists looked up the student's name and said, No, you can't leave. You have one more class. <laughs> and we used to go over and have ice cream in between classes yeah. and whatever we wanted to do, you know. I'm so glad I grew up when I did. It was just really yeah. a free, wonderful time. Yeah. It's kind of like, I think that's going to continue to. Like, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. even more so now. Um, let's see. What was a perfect day when you were a kid? Every day was perfect. <laughs> I loved the tennis and the golf and the swimming and all the fun we had at home. And I loved the homemade ice cream mom made. And oh, man, that sounds good. Yes. Um, did you have any, like, big neighborhood landmarks? Um, 
you're you're talking about uh, like uh, ice cream shops or like places like hangouts um we didn't because our neighborhood was just very suburban yeah uh you'd go down about a mile and get to uh belmont shore Mm -hmm. which was uh, just in from the ocean and then that was where the movie theater was, where we went, and the stores, and the, all that kind of stuff. But huh. right around us, it was just us and the lagoon and the golf course. <laughs> Tough <laughs> Sounds duty. good to me. Yeah. It was wonderful. Um, did you go to camp? Yes, yeah. yes. Oh, I got to tell you something about the lagoon. Right. You know, there was our house here, and then an alleyway, and then a group of houses along Monrovia Street, and then from Monrovia, it just sloped down into the lagoon. Mm-hmm. Well, on the top of this slope on Monrovia Street, we'd all the whole neighborhood would show up there on the 4th of July, and our dads would buy, pool their efforts and buy f- uh, fireworks, and they'd shoot them into the lagoon, which was perfectly safe. And we'd all sit there on our deck chairs <laughs> or on the curb and watch our own fireworks display. It was fantastic. Yeah, it sounds pretty cool. Great neighborhood. Yeah. Like a block party, like 4th Uh of July. Yeah, we had lots of block parties, right. Um, Have you ever seen a president in person? Yes. When Grandpa Bob had his dental office in La Cañada, Mm -hmm. President Nixon came campaigning. Really? And he was in some kind of an open Jeep or something. He was sitting up high with someone next to him and the driver, and he stopped there right at the corner by Bob's office, and we all gathered around and heard him speak. And the thing that surprised me most was how short he was. You know, you just don't see people. But I got thinking about Napoleon and (laughs) all the short men who seem to have this drive to be president or head of something. Yeah, because generally, like, when they shoot the president, they shoot from below. So, exactly. Yeah. It makes him look yeah. taller. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, let's see. Like, were there any, like, mountains or, like, popular lakes or rivers that you went to? Like, well, of course, Lake Arrowhead was yeah. our favorite. Yeah. yeah. And and uh, Bob and I had a home built. Well, we bought a little home there, and then later we had one built. Uh, because we'd walk down this vacant lot to get to our dock, and we thought, ah, uh, and yeah. it was a perfect spot, and we built an A-frame house there, and it was so fun, and we went every weekend all summer. We loved it, and that was just really the bonding, most wonderful time of our family. And We were there for Christmas. We weren't all going off to different parties. We were there alone together, and it was just really special. Yeah. Loved it. It's a pretty beautiful country. It really is. Um, Have your parents taken you up there to see it? They took me to Diamond or Lake Diamond or something. Diamond Lake. Oh, Diamond Lake. Yeah, uh-huh. it, it's like it's pretty close, I guess. Uh-huh. Or like uh-huh. I like it. Yeah. Yeah. That was a really pretty lake. Arrowhead was great. They had a little tiny church there. Well, it wasn't even a church. They just met in a hall. I guess it used to be a garage or something. And the first time we went, there were twenty-two members, <laughs> <laughs> including us. And then it grew over the 10 or 15 years that we had the cabin there, and they built a beautiful chapel, and it was neat. Hmm. Sounds pretty cool. Um, Did you do well in science and math, or like... (laughs) Or or did you do better in like English and art? (laughs) Thanks. We'll take the positive. I was just telling him I got C's in chemistry, (laughs) but I did really well in... uh, And then when I went back to dental hygiene school, everything was science. Yeah. But I studied hard, and I got through, and when I'd taken the final, the the state board exams in dental hygiene, I was in the top 10 in the nation. Not bad. So that was okay. I got through chemistry a second time, (laughs) in spite of all the C's I'd gotten earlier. What? Top 10% or top 10? Top 10% in the nation, Uh uh-huh, in in the dental hygiene board. Is dental hygiene more chemistry or like... uh... It was a lot of physiology, too. Physiology, yeah. yeah. And someone said, have you ever learned, have you ever used any of that stuff? I've used everything I've ever learned. You know, one time a doctor said to me, well, we need to do an exam and do some cellular examinations here. And and then he called me back and said, well, you had some columnar cells and you had some, you know, and I thought, aha, 
I have looked at columnar cells through the, you know. Biology. Yeah. yeah. Well, the worst class was this one where everything was slides. And the final exam was a whole room full of microscopes with slides. And you had to go from microscope to microscope and tell what was on these slides. Mm-hmm. That was Sounds a cute class. Sounds kind of hard to me. That was a cute class. <laughs> but I got through it. Um, let's see. How did World War II affect your life? Well, first of all, there were no fellows around. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I didn't true. have a lot of dates. My first year at BYU, there were 200 fellows and 1,200 girls. Whoa. That was the whole student body. And now what is it, 30,000? Something like that. I'm not quite sure. The second year I was there, the, world, the war ended, and there were 5,000 students. So we had a lot return. Hmm. But uh, World War II was like um, gas rationing. Couldn't go places. Yeah. Uh, I took the bus back and forth from the Y, and we had to go 35 miles an hour to conserve gas. Oh, yeah. There were a 35. lot of crazy things. Whoa. Yeah. And then one night while I was in high school living in Long Beach, all of a sudden in the middle of the night, it was like thunder and lightning. Mm-hmm. And the windows were just flashing on and off. And the next day I learned that there were no Japanese planes coming over uh, California, but they thought there were. Oh. And our anti-aircraft were shooting like crazy. And that's what I woke up to in the middle of the night. Hmm. And I thought, that's as close as I, I ever want to get to a war. Yeah. <laughs> no enemy, thank you. Just <laughs> let them practice. <laughs> yeah, I can understand. Yeah. Um, did you ever play a musical instrument? We talked about that, Lil oh. and I. Yeah. All right. Uh-huh. <laughs> Hey, sweet. thanks for coming. You are great. Thank you. I love Happy you to birthday. pieces. Mm. You're sweet. This is my daughter, Carol, who has just put on this wonderful birthday party for me today, together with her sisters, Sue and Louise. Okay. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Love you. What was your first job, your first real job? Or did you have an after-school job? You don't count the ones where my mother made me go and clean people's houses because they couldn't afford anybody or they were sick. Oh. Because <laughs> you didn't get paid for those. No, It was no. kindness. <laughs> where Let's did you see. actually get your first paycheck? Well, I probably did babysitting a lot. Uh-huh. <laughs> I can remember them pounding on the door to wake me up. Uh, I worked in a drugstore in Long Beach, and I worked in a um, during the summers between college. And uh, I worked in a preschool in Long Beach. Maybe that was between high school years Mm -hmm. and college. Mm -hmm. That kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, Are there any um, um, early co-workers that you particularly remember? Oh, yes. I worked at Springs, formerly Gump's, which was a downtown Long Beach Uh, luggage and handbag shop Mm -hmm. and um, Virginia Clegg worked there and she was a darling and she and I still exchange Christmas cards Mm -hmm. letters every year yeah she lives up in Tahunga Mm -hmm. Um, what has been one of your favorite jobs well I love dental hygiene did it for 20 years of a particular office or oh dr chipman Mm -hmm. terry chipman was just like a brother to me i loved him still do Mm -hmm. yeah he's great Mm -hmm. he had uh, merged two families when their parents passed away and uh, i catered all their weddings and their missionary farewells and their missionary homecomings Mm -hmm. and terry and i've just been the best friends did you ever ha- ride through any rocky times in any in any job? Were there any times that were really tough for you? Oh, sure. There were dentists that I just... <laughs> I got fired once because I was telling the dental assistant she shouldn't be doing what the dentist should be doing, and so I got fired. But I figured, if you don't have your integrity, what do you have? Yeah. And then there were those I quit who were trying to sell dentistry that didn't need to be needed. And so I quit. I don't want to make money. I want to, you know, do it right. So you really felt that one of the questions since here, did you feel you had a career or just a job? 
Oh, I had a career. career. Sure. Um, have you ever had anything published? Yes, three people have asked me that. <laughs> okay, sorry. Okay. Well, I'm not marking these yeah, that I've already right. asked. That's all right. Keep going. Okay. Uh, I was going to make sure I did that. Did you look forward to retirement? Um, I guess not because I just kept working and working and working, and I quit just before we went on our mission to Austria. And, and now I wish I'd quit 10 years ago, and I wish we were just finishing our fifth mission instead <laughs> of our first. Hmm. Um, because my job wasn't a terrible job. I, I loved the patients, and and I think they liked me. The gal over here at Dr. Manwaring's office says, oh, the patients still ask about you, and where are you? And when you see people every three months, you, you get well acquainted. Um, did you ever work unusual hours anywhere? No. Um, Were, were you ever passed over for a position you thought you deserved? Or any position that you really wanted that you never got? No, because dental hygiene, the, the hygienists were yeah, scarce, okay. and I could pretty well get wherever I wanted. Mm -hmm. Was there anyone you worked with that you particularly admired? Dr. Chipman. Okay. Okay. So we're done with that chapter. Yeah. <laughs> Romance and relationships. <laughs> you can skip that one. Okay. Is that David's well, question? <laughs> yeah, I'll let Dave do this chapter. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Carol. Go back to sleep, Will. <laughs> Hi, this is my son-in-law, David Smith, Carol's husband. What do you say, Dave? Um, I say I need a set of glasses to read the question, and now I'll ask my question. Uh, when your children were growing up, did you always take them along on vacation, or were there times when you uh, could get away by yourself? Oh, all of the above, yeah. We had this wonderful home at Lake Arrowhead, and we took the kids there, and we went almost every weekend. We were right on the water, and we went water skiing. And So there was you great. had a boat? Yes, yes. We had a boat, and it was called Sukaloo. Guess who it was named after? Sue, Carol, and Louise. <laughs> Sukaloo. And uh, Louise just didn't water ski until she was about seven, but she taught everybody else how. <laughs> you know, like, keep your fanny low. And, well, we learned that in Mexico. Yes, Bob and I got away by ourselves once in a while. And we went to Mexico, and we tried water skiing down there, and we were hooked. And I got up the first time I tried, and it was so fun. But the man down there that taught us was very Mexican, and he would say, keep your fanny low. <laughs> <laughs> so every time we taught anybody, we, that was the line we used, and Louise knew it. Carol was a fantastic water skier. She was doing the backward stuff and the everything, back and forth and all, and fast. Loved it. We just had a great time, great time water skiing. She still skis pretty well. And yes, we, we loved getting away by ourselves. We went to Hawaii on our 10th anniversary and had a great time over there and saw the hula dancers and learned to hula on the boat. We went on a boat to Hawaii. They did that oh. in those days. Yeah. You didn't fly. There was only... No, we, fl we went on the boat. Took three days to get there. <laughs> it was really neat. And we had a big party when we left and they threw the paper streamers down off the boat you know we f we threw them down to everybody and we had a going away party with the bottle in our cabin before we left and invited our friends and relatives to come they wouldn't let anybody on a boat now that wasn't going to fly that wasn't going to go with them will and i went on a wonderful trip to uh, alaska this last summer and uh, boy you had to check in and check out but it was a great trip. We loved that, too. But there's differences of traveling to Alaska on the inward, inland passageway on a boat where it's fairly smooth and going to Hawaii on a boat where open ocean could get oh, yeah. real yeah. rough. How did you take that boat trip? I mean, how was it? Well, how did your physical... Mind you, I was getting you know, three little kids ready to leave as well as, you know, uh -huh. to stay with Grandma. while, And I got on the boat and I was still, <laughs> you know... And then the first day, the boat was going like this, and I was still, and then I finally relaxed. 
and I started to enjoy the trip, and I forgot about, the, well, not entirely, but I let the kids be, and I just had a good time. Good, good. <laughs> Have you ever been camping? Yes, yes. We went camping with Gerald and Louise. In fact, when Will and I were first married, we bought a tent, and we've used it once, haven't we, dear? In 22 years, that's pretty good. But uh, we loved camping up in Idaho, was it, with Daryl and Louise? And, and, and we've been out doing the Rogue, not the Rogue River, the, what's the river out here that you go down the rapids? And, Colorado and Green. No, green, Green, the Green, green river. river. We've we've done the rapids on the Green, yes. That was an interesting time because we went alongside a couple of, uh, um, a man and two women and some little kids and they got ahead of us, and all of a sudden, they were on a big rock in the middle of the river, and their boat was not there. They were just there in the middle of this, and right below the rock, it was going down in a waterfall. And so we pulled over to see if we could help them, and some other boats did, and there was some guy who was trying to throw them a line, and somebody went down the river and got their boat and brought it back to them. And so the man got in first and then the women and children were on the <laughs> he was something else but finally with a lot of help from the people from the shore he finally got them all aboard and they got down oh. do you ever get homesick when you travel or when you've traveled um, you want to go camping or... the first year of college i was homesick at thanksgiving time but on travels i just enjoy it to the hilt and then it's always good to be home what kind of gifts do you usually bring home when you when you travel? Dolls for Lily. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, uh, after enjoying chocolate all of Carol. the yes, and chocolate for Carol. Oh, and don't forget the little <laughs> Easter eggs for <laughs> Elliot, <laughs> yeah. and the, and the Harry Potter book for Lily from England when it wasn't published here. But after enjoying all the knickknacks that my mother and dad have brought from all over the world, I've decided we don't need things from the world. We just enjoy the trip and then come home and think about our memories. Great. I like that attitude. We've had a lot of fun. A lot of fun. Will and I have had some great trips. Yep. Good. Well, that's, the only qu that's all the questions I'm going to ask you because I'm sure there are many other people that want to get it. Well, I have tape. to tell you, my so. best trip to Europe was with your with your your daughter, oh. with Carol. Oh, okay. Tell when, me when I was single, and she uh -huh. said, "Mom, I'm in Iran. I can meet you for the summer any place you want to." And so I got the cheapest flight I could find. It was Amsterdam, and she met me there, and we had some wonderful times together. Icelandic Airlines. I don't know. Anyway, I got there, and it was a great trip with Carol. That was fun. Great, super. Love you, David. Okay. Thanks so much. Uh huh. This is my grandson, Nathan High. Love How's him. How's it going, Grandma? Great. Nathan's all home from his mission to Montana, working hard, going to college. Great. Yep. Good to have you here. Glad to be here. Well, I wanted to ask you about uh, like uh, different uh, holidays. Um, how do you feel about Easter? Oh, Easter is a very special time. I love the. I love the real meaning of Easter, the story of the Savior, and uh, his rising on the third day, that's special. And then we've always had some fun Easter egg hunts in our house, and had the kids over to color eggs, and it's just a great grandma-grandchild time. I remember uh, growing up, you'd boil all the eggs, and you'd set them out and say, all right, here's the colors, and you'd... Uh You'd give us uh, brushes or um, different colors from food coloring, and and then later that day, you guys you'd send us out, and then you'd hide them all. <laughs> and that was all. It's a pretty fun time. That's fun. It was fun for me too. Glad you remember it. When you were uh, growing up, um, what memories do you have of like Halloween taking the kids out? Oh, uh, yeah, we'd go door-to-door -door with all the kids. And uh, and when I was little, we went trick-or-treating, too, and always had a costume. When I was in junior high, they were trying to get the kids off the streets, and so they would have a Halloween fair at the school 
on Halloween night. But uh, one night when we were a little older, why uh, some of the boys and girls said, come on, let's go. And so we went through a neighborhood and the boys, I didn't realize, they would take, they would go up the alleys and take the trash cans and throw them into the yards of the people. <laughs> well, that's the last time I went with those kids. That wasn't the kind of stuff I wanted to do on Halloween. Thank you. <laughs> You have to be careful who you're with, don't you? Yeah, these were good kids in school, but they just wanted to play pranks that night. Um, Did you or your schoolmates exchange Valentine uh, cards in elementary school? Yeah, and we used to make them, and we had little lace doilies we'd make them out of, and little stickers and all kinds of fun things, yeah. And we'd always always make one for the teacher. That's nice. Um, uh, did you get uh, flowers on Valentine's Day or candy or something from? My sweetheart Will always brings me flowers or candy, often sees candy. He knows that's my favorite, like the box he gave me for my birthday today. <laughs> what are your memories on uh, New Year's Eve? Hmm. I know I like to stay up late. Oh, one year, Carol wanted to stay up till 12 o'clock, and we were at Lake Arrowhead, and we wanted to go to bed. So she kept insisting. She was kind of little. And uh, so her dad had the radio on, and he called her, and he says, Oh, come here, Carol. It's New Year's Eve. They're singing Old Lang Syne. And it was from Denver, Colorado, so it was an hour oh, yes. earlier, than an hour later than California. So she was satisfied that she got to ring in the new year at midnight. <laughs> and it was really only 11 oh, o'clock gosh. at Lake Arrowhead, <laughs> and she went to bed, and we went to bed. <laughs> it was perfect. That's a perfect plan. <laughs> um. When it was your first Father's Day, uh, you felt, uh, whoops, wrong question. How about that? What, um, like, what memorable experience did you have on Mother's Day? Well, Sue was born on Mother's Day, May 8th, 1948. Nine. Nine, excuse me, that's right. <laughs> and, uh, and Louise's birthday is the 13th, you know, and so yeah. many times her birthday has been on Mother's Day. So it's always a very special day in our family. That's great. And I loved my mother. I couldn't have had a better mother. She was the best example to me and probably the greatest influence in my life. And she was so full of love. I can remember when I was about five or six years old and she said, Mary Jane, come and sit on my lap. And she told me how much she loved me and hugged me. And she said, Mary Jane, I hope you never get too big to sit on my lap. And I just have always remembered that love from my mother. And then I remember how funny she is. She's always had a great sense of humor and loved to play little simple tricks on us and joke and tell funny stories. And she was great in that way. And then what an example in the church. She was always the ward or stake relief society president or doing something for other people. Uh, we used to tease and say we grew up in the back seat of the car while Mother was in making visits to somebody, and she'd say, I'll only be a minute, and the three <laughs> of us girls would have to sit in the car. But now I realize what good Mother was doing by those minutes. But we said it was really great when Mother went into the mortuary to help them dress the bodies or see that the temple clothes were on correctly because the mortuary had a big uh, fountain and a courtyard, and we'd get out of the car and play around the fountain in the courtyard. So we thought that was a great stop (laughs) to go with Mother. But she was just a wonderful example to me, and uh, I love her dearly, and, and I couldn't have had a better mother, and I realize how important a good mother and a good dad are, as you well know. 
very Don't good. You? I yeah. love my mother very yeah. well. Well, you're a great son and a great grandson. Thank you for Thanks, being so wonderful. Love you. Love you too. Thanks for having me here. Loved it. This is my grandson, Kimball High. He's Louise's second son, and he's just returned from his mission to Mississippi, Jackson. That's right. Wonderful. We loved hearing him on Mother's Day in the group call, and he says, I'm doing right here. I'm doing everything I'm supposed to be doing. <laughs> He'd really picked up an accent. It was so cute. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, and I'm grateful to be here and talk to you a little bit, Grandma, thank about uh, about some things. And I've always appreciated your uh, dedication and service that you've offered in, in your life. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit about uh, the service that you've rendered other people in your lifetime. What um, do you, I don't know, and I'm sure there are many from just looking through some of the books today uh, of being on the cheerleader squad at BYU to the president of the Dental Association in California. What are, what are the, um, we'll sort of get a resume from you. What are the leadership positions you've held in your life in secular and sacred? Yes, I served as the president of the Dental Wives in Southern Cal in the in the district that we lived in. And they asked me to be the one for the whole Southern California, but I went to a dear friend that I was serving with as a counselor to her in the Young Women's Program, and she said, "You know, Mary Jane, <laughs> I think it might be well for you to stay home with your family instead of traveling all over the state." So I passed that one up. But it was good to be with the dental wives. And <clears throat> I can remember one meeting we had together, and one of the ladies said, I think it's silly to remember everybody's birthday. And they voted on it, and they voted not to. And after the vote was over, I said, you know, that's one of the reasons we meet as dental wives, to get acquainted with one another and get to know each other and to have a good bonding here. And I think maybe birthdays is a good way to do that, is one of the good ways. And you know, they turned the decision over just like that. And that was a real turning point in my life. It's the first time I remembered that what I said could make a difference. And I guess I got my leadership genes from my mother and my dad. Because like I said, mother's always been the president of the Ward and Stake Relief Society. And dad was bishop, high council, stake pres two different stake presidencies he was counselor to. And uh, so I just kind of grew up with that, and, and it's been a natural. I uh, was president of the young women's in uh, the ward and the stake in California. And then when I moved to Utah, uh, I was the Relief Society president in President Kimball's ward. And um, then when I moved to Holiday, uh, we'd only been here a few days and they called me to be the primary president, and I didn't even know anybody well enough to ask for counselors. But they gave me two wonderful girls, and as you serve with people, you have a bonding there that is just so special, and the people I've served with are my best friends now, forever. And now I'm the Relief Society president again, <laughs> and uh, just really enjoying it, have wonderful counselors and so on. Are there other positions um, outside of the church that you've that you've held also? I've always been involved in politics on the precinct level. In California, I was a precinct chairman, and that pretty much involved getting people registered to vote and then calling them the day before and getting the vote out. And I liked doing that because I'm not too fussy how they vote as long as they vote, then I know we've heard from the people. Wow. And then when we moved to Holiday, I was involved in the same kind of thing. Uh, when they organized the new city of Holiday, I was asked to be on the Envision Holiday Committee, which was kind of one to say, what do you think Holiday ought to be as a new city? And we met every once a week, and they asked me to chair that. Well, I'd just been called to be the Relief Society president, so I said, no, thank you. <laughs> But I ended up chairing the grand opening of the new Holiday City Hall just about a year, or well, six months after the city was organized. Okay. 
And we had a thousand people turn out. We had a 5K race. We served breakfast. We had tours of the new city hall. We had dignitaries from everybody face come. We had prizes to give away, free drawings, you know. And How about that? It was a really successful day. And people from all aspects of the city came together. Didn't matter what religion they were, what color they were, which party they had voted for. They all came together that day and made a wonderful feeling in holiday. Wow. And I felt good about that. Well, well, and I also heard that there was a, there was some controversy with uh, selling or distributing alcohol at one of these events for Holiday City. Uh, the one we had was early in the summer, and then later in the fall they had one over at the mall, and it was kind of called a taste of holiday, and the different restaurants were doing things, and one of the restaurants wanted to serve alcohol. Well, I immediately emailed the mayor, and you know there's something nice about having served with the mayor in a close <laughs> position like this. She and I are on a first-name basis, and we know each other well, and we love each other, and I just had a, a phone message on my answer phone last night when I came in from Mayor Leanne Stillman, and she was thanking me for the article that I'd written for the newspaper that was just published in the letters to the editor. And, um, and she's, she's wonderful. When the storm drain was coming down and filling up our irrigation ditch, I called down to City Hall, and she says, Jerry Medina will take care of that for you. <laughs> he was out here and had the thing cleaned out with some great huge vacuum cleaner. And he said, now how often do you want this done? <laughs> I said, every spring, please, so that we can use it. You know, it's not a storm drain. It's our irrigation ditch. Sure. So um, serving has, you know, it comes back to you. You don't do it for that reason, but it has its, its perks too. Mm -hmm. Well, so on this alcohol thing, I, I really objected. And, um, and they had a little bit of a problem with it. They finally did let the people do it with no advertising, no anything. That was just, you know just like you were serving them lemonade, and it was there if you wanted it. Hmm. But Yeah, well, that's interesting. I've also um, noticed in your lifetime, just as we've talked, and especially on my mission, is uh, I would get letters from you that you have gained associations with a lot of, a lot, a lot of people. I remember uh, you said uh, one time that uh, Elder Hales lived in your, lived in your home in La Cunata, and uh, another time you said you knew uh, Elder Oaks, and I knew that you handed your mission papers directly to President Packer. No, Elder. Or Elder. Um, <laughs> I just lost his name. <laughs> One of the 12. Ballard. Elder Ballard. Elder Ballard. Okay. So, and how have you gained uh, association with a lot of a lot of these gentlemen? Well, Elder Hales and his family were coming to California. He was a regional representative at the time, and he was coming to California to be a, a consultant for Max Factor because Max Factor wanted to go worldwide. And he had had experience in Spain and Germany and England, and he was the youngest bishop in Europe at one time. Every two years of his life, his married life, he moved to be a consultant with a different firm. Oh, wow. And uh, he and Mary and their two sons were coming to California, and the bishop called me and said they need a place to live for about three months until they can buy a house and get it through escrow. But they need to move the 1st of September so that they can get their boys started in school. And I was living a, a, alone in this five-bedroom home across from the golf course in La Cunata. And Bishop said, could they live with you? And I said, sure, I'd love it. Well, it was one of the most special experiences of my life to see this dear family. Mary is just precious. I love her. And I watched the way they interfaced with their boys and how they'd have private councils, and they'd go in the bedroom alone with them. I don't know what they said, but we'd have family home evening every Monday night. And just before the oldest boy w w turned old enough to uh, say the blessing on the sacrament, uh, they, they had him practice that prayer in family home evening so that he would know it well enough he wouldn't sit at the sacrament table and make a mistake and be embarrassed. You know, it was all these kinds of little things that I noticed. Uh, Bishop 
Collister got the parents and the chil- the uh, teenagers together and said, I've noticed that people act the way they look. And at that time, they were wearing really long hair, the boys were. And so he said, it seems to me that we might uh, improve our actions by by conforming with our looks a little bit. And so instead of just whacking this boy's hair off, Mary Hales cut an inch a day until it got up to where he wanted it to be. And I thought, that's so considerate of the boy. She was being obedient to the bishop, and yet she wasn't going to have him go to school one day and say, ah, look at you. It was very, very thoughtful. And Mary was a great cook and wonderful. Hmm. Then when I moved to Salt Lake, uh, I didn't know where I was moving, but I happened to move into the same ward with President Kimball and the Maxwells. And it was Elder Maxwell, not Elder Oaks, that I knew. Oh, okay. And uh, and his wife is an angel. She is the gem of the world. And they invited me over to dinner because I was a single woman who was new in the ward. And they were just so wonderful to me. And um, then when it came time for Will and I to be married, why we asked Elder Maxwell, who had then since become a member of the, for the Quorum of the Twelve, and we asked him if he would marry us in the temple, and he did. And it was a very, very special day. He said to us in the temple, your marriage has been arranged in heaven a long time ago. And that was so special to Will and me. Yeah. It was really wonderful. We had a great interface with President and Sister Kimball. I've been in their home a number of times. When I served in the Young Women's, when I was first in that ward, why we went Christmas caroling and he invited us in, and we all sat cross-legged in his little small house on the floor, and we sang carols to him. And then at the very end, and he always sang with us, and at the very end we sang, We Thank Thee, O God, for a Prophet. Well, all the rest of them sang. I just was choked up. (laughs) And he sang that with us, too. And when when we were all finished singing, we thanked the old God for a prophet, President Kimball said, I love that song. It always reminds me of the prophet Joseph. See how he turned all the praise to someone else. Yeah. Dear sweet man. And Camilla was just a wonderful lady, brilliant, that iring mind, and she taught our, our lessons, and when it came to cultural refinement, we were studying different countries, and they'd say, Sister Kimball, tell us about your experience in this country, and she says, well, I've seen the airport and the church, <laughs> but she went with him on these trips, and they had a great time. She always inspired us to read one of the books of the scriptures all the way through, each year that she taught spiritual living. And then at the end of the year, she would invite us who had completed the reading into her home and serve us lunch. And then we'd all sit around and share our favorite scripture. And this was what she'd ask us to do. Huh. And so now I'm doing this by her example in our ward. Well, that's neat. That's really neat. Um, one last thing that I wanted to ask you about is uh, you seem to uh, have been... Uh, put place an importance in your life on education um, and learning. Uh, I don't know how many people went to college at your, the age that you went to college, but I don't think the percentage is as much as or as yeah as much as it is today. And college uh, wasn't as important to people back then. But uh, as a especially as a woman, you decided to achieve an education. Was that your decision to go to college, uh, your parents' decision, or and what importance has education played on your life? I think education is very, very important, and I'm glad I had the opportunity to go to college. Uh, my parents provided the way and the means, and I'm grateful to them. My father had an eighth grade education, and yet he realized the the importance of education and he had a stack of books by his bed he was constantly reading he had books in the living room by his favorite chair he was constantly studying he went back to night school 
and he took a class in uh, several classes, and one of them was in public speaking. And he became a very wonderful public speaker. And the sweet little ladies in the ward just loved him, and they'd say, now, President Minor, you'll speak at my funeral, won't you? And he was just in demand in that way. He, he, we all loved hearing him talk. He was real. He was scriptural. He was spiritual. It was wonderful. And uh, he was a great example to me. When, when I went away to college, he gave me a blessing, and they provided me with a monthly allowance and my tuition. And the other day I read an article that said, if you save $50 a month for the entire time of your child from birth to college, you'll be able to pay for his tuition. It's gone up a little. Mine was $104 at BYU. Wow. <laughs> I'd pay that for one semester hour. of. <laughs> but my wages weren't, you know. Sure. My father said to me, and here's my uneducated father who was quoting Shakespeare. He said, never a borrower nor a lender be. And you know, that has many facets to it. Because now that credit cards and all this are so popular, I can remember my parents saying, my dad's brother borrowed money, bought a um, vacuum cleaner on time. Do you know what they'll pay for that vacuum cleaner by the time they get it paid off with all that interest? You know, dad was looking at the big picture. Uncle Earl was looking at, oh, I can have a vacuum cleaner today, which is the way a lot of us look. If I just charge this, I can have it today. But you're borrowing, so never a borrower nor a lender be. And it makes sense, mm -hmm. because what you pay in interest is just horrendous. And nor a lender be makes sense as well, because then you always have to collect it from the guy who doesn't want to make the payments. And I had people in my dorm who saw that I had more money than they did. And pretty soon I wrote to my dad and said, I don't want to loan money to my roommates and friends. Uh, please cut my allowance. And so he did. And it just, uh, it just makes sense. Money can be a very important part of your life if you don't make it the most important. If you just use it, not abuse it. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much for talking with me about thank you. these great things. You're wonderful. Love you, Love you too. This is Julie Allen. Ken and Sue's daughter from Palo Alto. Good to have you here. Oh no, you're from San Diego now, aren't you? Going to so. university down there. Wonderful. Proud of you. Okay. Um, so why don't you tell me something about what radio programs you listened to when you were growing up? Listen, I'm so old. We had a radio that was about this high and about this wide, and it sat on the floor, <laughs> and we'd all hovel around and listen to the Lone Ranger and get him up Tonto and, and Burns and Allen and all those fun shows. One Man's Family. And Charlie McCarthy. <laughs> yes, Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy. <laughs> all right, good deal. They were great. <coughs> Real good humor. What was your favorite kind of radio show? Oh, just all of those, yeah. And then later as I grew up, then I liked to listen to music. And uh, we had a record player. And I can remember one time I was trying to remember, memorize the words to this song, and I kept playing it over and over. And it was a real jazzy one, and it just drove my mother crazy. <laughs> she came in, Mary Jane, what are you doing? <laughs> just trying to learn the words, Mom, you know. <laughs> Do you remember what your first record was? Mm-mm. Really? Mm-mm. Mm-mm. Do you remember some of your favorites? Oh, I just loved all the big bands. And uh, when I was in high school, we'd go up to the Palladium, and it was a great big dance hall in Hollywood. And uh, we'd dance to Tommy Dorsey and Jimmy Dorsey and Glenn Miller and Artie Shaw and all the wonderful big bands do swing. It was a great place to go, wonderful. All right, uh, when did you get your first TV? Well, I saw television the very first time when I was living at home in Long Beach, and my dad and I went over to the VA hospital for something, and they had a news program, program going on. I think it was Edward R. Murrow, and here was this little black and white TV 
on a big stand and we watched the news. Um, then after I married Bob, I remember we went to a store one time and we saw TV in the window and that was exciting. Well, then it wasn't very long after that that we bought one. Bob loved these toys. And we were in dental school at the time and couldn't afford it, but we got one anyway. Well, he was doing well. The laundrette put us through dental school. And uh, our friends would all come over at our apartment and watch TV because none of them had one. It was a big deal to come to our house and watch TV. What kind of programs did you watch? Oh... There were all kinds of things on. Um, I don't remember. <laughs> of course, we watched football and baseball, mm-hmm. always. I heard that uh, my mom had an interesting first song. What was the first song she learned? Motorola TV, Motorola TV. Watch too much TV as a kid. Uh, it, it was the commercials, and they sink in with little kids, yeah. and they still do. And the whole thing is geared towards sinking into you. Yeah. What kind of music do you listen to now? I've always liked classical music. Mm-hmm. Any particular composers? Um, I love them all. I just turn on K U E R and listen to the beautiful symphonies and. That was one of the treats of being in Austria was that we had such wonderful musical experiences over there. Um, let's see. Uh, do you enjoy going to the theater or ballet or do you do things like that? Yes, yes. We saw Swan Lake in Austria and it was the most beautiful rendition of that ba- ballet I could ever imagine. It was perfection gorgeous and we went to the philharmonic the will thinks the vienna philharmonic is the greatest orchestra in the world and it probably is beautiful that's great thank you for coming julie you're a sweetheart i love you you good luck in college proud of you this is my daughter sue allen susan (laughs) so fun to have you here from palo alto it's great to be here Okay, we're going to talk about you being a grandparent. So, where were you when your first grandchild was born and who called and told you about it? Well, you did. I did. I know. <laughs> it was Rachel. Yeah. And we were very excited to get her. Yep. Um, did you come and help with the new baby? I can still remember flying into the airport. I don't know whether it was San Jose or where. And you came to the airport with babe in arms <laughs> to greet me, and that was such a happy sight. Beautiful to see you with the little daughter. I remember you came and helped us move. That's right. We moved from an apartment to your house about that time, didn't we? Yeah, all in one week. It was a mm-hmm. big week. <laughs> and had a new baby besides. What about your other grandchildren? What happened when they were born? How many grandchildren do you have now? We have ten. You have four. Uh, Carol and David have two, and Daryl and Louise have four. And the one I remember is when Carol and Louise, C- Carol and David had their first when Elliot was born, and David called and left a message on our answer phone. And Carol and David were a little longer, older, longer in years than most of you when you had your first. And David was so excited about this. And when he called and left a message on our answer phone, his voice was all choked up. It was just, it was so sweet that Elliot was born. (laughs) Everything was fine. And I saved that message. It's recorded. (laughs) That's great. What happened on the 8th of February, 1978? Well, a lot of people have been born on the 8th of February. (laughs) Ken? (laughs) No, Ken's the 20th. Who else is on the 8th? Daryl. Daryl was on the 8th, and then Nathan was born on the 8th. Yes, so he was born on his dad's birthday, like Carol was born on her dad's birthday. Yes, and Reed, almost. That was, remember, that was the day we got Reed. Oh, that's right, that's right. I always think of Reed's 28th, 9th of 
December, but you got him on got the 8th of February. Eight, so that was a happy day. It was a great all day around. all around. Uh, yeah, we got Reed and Nathan all in one day into the family. Wonderful. So did you ever make anything by hand for any of your grandchildren? Toys or clothes or anything? Wow, I can't remember. If it had to be knitted, I probably did. <laughs> you did. You knit stuff for my kids. Did I? Yeah. Good. A little suit for Keith. No, for Reed. It was blue and white. Hmm. I think you did something for Rachel, too. Good. <laughs> Have you babysat your kids, your grandkids? Oh, yes. Yes. Loved it. <laughs> like I said earlier, I had uh, both Lily and Elliot every Wednesday on my day off before they started school. And by the time Elliot had started school, then Lily came along and I had them, and it was fun. What toys and special things do you have at your house for your grandchildren? I used to have a big cupboard full of toys, <laughs> but uh, Lily is now 13, and so the toys are pretty well beat up and gone. <laughs> but we still have a shelf full of children's books here. They're getting a little beat up too, but we always had Epaminondas. Don't you remember that one? Oh, yes. <laughs> my, step in those pies. my mother <laughs> told me that story, and I told it to you and the grandchildren. And my kids like that story too. They ask about it. And now you have great-grandchildren. Isn't that wonderful? How many great-grandchildren do you have? Two. And uh, Rachel is having a third. Yes. But um, both um, Ashley and Megan came and interviewed right. me earlier. They came and talked there on the table. Beautiful. Um, how do, you, do any of your grandchildren look like your own children? I don't know. It was little? fun. I put all those picture books around the dining table this, today, and this one looks like you, and they were matching them all up, and I'd never really thought of that too much. But there is a resemblance between some of them. Oh, I think Lily has always been the image of Carol to me. Yes. In baby yes. pictures and stuff. Yes. Yeah. And it was fun to see how uh -huh. both Keith and Nathan or Kimball. Yeah, Keith and Kimball both, both look, look like, like Bob, don't yeah, they? Yeah, uh -huh. they look like Grandpa, so yeah, it's fun. Um, what do you fix your grandchildren to eat when they come to visit? All the food I can scrape together because now they're long-legged, skinny <laughs> teenagers and they just eat everything in sight. <laughs> and I love to have them come. Uh, yeah, while you've been up here talking, you'll be amazed at what happened to your box of Halloween, basket of Halloween candy downstairs. <laughs> That's why I put it out. <laughs> um, what artwork have they brought you? Oh, lovely pictures. And Rachel did some little... Uh, clay ornaments for the tree and every year it is so fun to see those and get them out and put them on our Christmas tree. Yeah. Megan or no Ashley brought you a picture today too didn't she? Yes she did beautiful yes, she, she colored it uh-huh yep what are your wishes for your grandchildren? That they know the love and the peace and the happiness that I've known that they have the guiding principles of the gospel in their lives. I know some of them don't go to church, but they have a tremendous amount of love in their families. And that is so important. Because when we love and respect our parents, then we do the things that they know is right for us. And, and, and they'll steer us right. There's so many evil influences in the, in the world today. And they're so tempting and they're so prevalent that it is wonderful to have guidance from loving parents who, who keep us away from some of these things, even though we don't know at the time how bad they can be for us. And to steer us into wonderful things like education and music and good friends and family and love. Mm -hmm. What do you want them to remember about you? I don't know. Silly grandma. <laughs> I had a nice compliment the other day. There's a family, the Robins, that live three houses down the street. And Dennis Robbins is a great big tall fellow, really cute. They're about the age of my children. And the other day Dennis looked at me and he said, MJ, when I grow up I want to be just like you are. <laughs> I thought that was a nice compliment. <laughs> So if my grandchildren aren't just like me, I, th I hope that they will, will like me. Mm -hmm. Now tell me about your grandparents. What was it like to be a grandchild? 
Well, I never knew my father's father because he died when my father was about five. And one day I went to Southern California and my sister Barbara, who had cleaned out our parents' home after their passing, handed me a little book and she said, Mary Jane, would you like this? And I looked at it and it was my grandfather Martin Miner's diary from his mission in Iowa, 1887. And I went home and started to put it in the computer so I could share it with everybody. And then I thought, Mother made a book with family histories five generations back. I think she has some quotes from this. Maybe I'll I'll learn something about Grandfather by reading Mother's book. And I went to it, and Mother had a quote there that was the day after this book stopped. So I called my niece, who uh, my cousin, uh, Donna Barnes, in Orem and said, Donna, is there a second diary someplace? And she said, yes, my uh, cousin, my, my cousin um, Kevin has it in Ohio. And she gave me Kevin's phone number. And I got the other half from Kevin. And then I put it in the computer. And I made some copies of Grandfather's beautiful handwriting. And I went to the Church Historical Society and all over and got pictures of places he'd lived and things about him and put it together in a book. And it was so neat. I made 75 copies and gave them to everybody for Christmas. So in that way, I got to know my father's father. And that was special. My father's mother, we talked about earlier, lived with us for a while. And she was a sweetheart. My mother's parents lived in Richfield. And they were Hiram Smith Christensen and Elizabeth Hanson Christensen. So we have Hansons on both sides of the family. Uh, they had a little house at 409 South 4th West in Richfield, 209 South 4th West. And uh, we would go to visit Grandma and Grandpa often. It was there I learned to shell peas. It was there I saw the cream in the cooler outside the house, uh, the cream in the milk, and they'd scoop off the cream, and they had a butter, what do you call it? Churner. Churner. And we learned to churn butter. And Grandpa took us out to the the barn and showed us the cows. And he was ready to milk. And he says, now look down here and see what I'm going to do. And the closer we got, then he (laughs) squirted us in the face with the milk. That's a standard, isn't it? (laughs) But it was fun for little kids growing up. And we saw Grandpa with a huge sugar beet. And we have a picture of that, one of the biggest that they'd ever grown. And they were wonderful people, and we loved to go and see them, and we loved to have them come and see us. So how often did you go to Richfield? Oh, I don't know, but we probably got there at least once a year. Oh, well, Dad often went deer hunting, and so Mother and the rest of us would visit with Grandma and Grandpa while uh, Dad and Grandpa went uh, deer hunting. So you'd go up in the fall then? Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So did you get to skip school to go? I guess so. (laughs) I don't remember. (laughs) And what did your grandfather do for a living? Was he a farmer? Uh, He was an assistant sheriff for a while. He was a farmer. And um, I think he kind of made loans. I'm not sure he made very much money at it because he was such a generous man. I can't see him ever (laughs) saying you've got to pay back. But uh, I'm not sure exactly what he did. But they made a living, and they were happy. Yeah. Uh, grandfather was not active, but they sent mother on a mission. She was a great uh, shorthand. She was the assistant deputy county clerk of Sevier County when she was 16. And two years later, when she s- turned 18, she was just about ready to go in their front gate, and the stake president came along and said, Pearl, I just received a phone call or a letter from the president of the mission in the western states and his headquarters were in Denver. Then they didn't have three missions in every state. It was western states. And he desperately needs a secretary in the mission office, and I wondered if you'd like to go on a mission. She was only 18, but she was a whiz at shorthand, and that's what he needed. And so they went inside and asked her parents, and her father said, yes, I'd be happy to provide the means for her to go on a mission. 
And so at age 18, mother went to Denver, Colorado and served a mission. I know, I think that's amazing, especially that she went so young. Yes, yes. But she was very much needed, and she was so beautiful then, <laughs> tall and thin, and those big blue eyes. It was nice. Have you talked about Grandma and Grandpa's mission that they went on together? No. They went to uh, southern states. <laughs> she served in the western states and the southern states. Uh huh. And they went in 1964 to 68, and my dad was assistant to the president of the mission. And they were headquartered in uh, Columbia, South Carolina, and the mission was headquartered in Atlanta, Georgia. But the mission president had a little family, and so he would say, President Miner, will you and your wife please go here, there, and, you know, everywhere, and will you interview these, and will you set apart these, and so forth. And so Dad had a lot of administrative responsibilities. Then one day, that mission president's wife passed away very suddenly, and they had a new mission president, and Dad was also a counselor to him. And uh, they had a great time in the South. They loved the people. They loved the flowers. Dad took 100 pictures. <laughs> they just love flowers, and Dad's like Ken. He always has a camera in his hand. But they served a wonderful mission there, and, and I have copies of talks they've given in their diaries, and journals. It's wonderful. So did Grandpa ever serve a mission when he was a young man? No, no. I said earlier to one of the kids, uh, he only had an eighth grade uh, education, and then he had to quit and go to work and help support his widowed mother. And yeah. So he had a very different life. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming, Sue, all the way from Palo Alto. Oh, so good to Great be with day. you. Thank and what you. a special day that was yesterday to see Reed and Jennifer sealed in the temple. Yeah. It was beautiful. And we'll continue this tape another day when they're around them. Can yes, get in on good. We'll look forward to it. Okay, good. Thank you so much. This is my granddaughter, Emily. She's Louise and Daryl's daughter. Fun to have you here today, Emily. You look Thank so beautiful. You. What did you want to ask me? Grandma, I'm kind of at a point in my life where I just am finishing school and starting my own career, and so I would like to hear about that stage in your life as well. You just finished dental hygiene school and starting a career and making money on your own and surviving on your own. Can you tell me a little bit about your experiences there and what you learned and how you felt about all of that? Well, I had majored in English in, at the BYU. In the end, I decided I better be able to earn a living and kind of help Bob through dental school. So I took some education classes, but I only taught school one semester. <laughs> and then Sue started to come along, and so I quit to be a full-time mom. And I was really glad I had done that. Then when I needed to have a career of my own, I was on my own at age 40-something. Uh, I thought, what do I know? And uh, I'd helped Bob a little bit at the dental office, so I went into dental hygiene school in Pasadena. There was a little bit of a problem because they had 450 applicants and they only chose 18. But I got in, <laughs> and it was great. And some of the professors were my same age, the uh, chemistry professor. I had to take off to be on the jury one time, and he says, go ahead. <laughs> you know, <laughs> he gave me a makeup class, and, and it worked out great. And I loved dental hygiene because I could work one day or six days a week Depending on how hungry I was, I usually worked three or four, and towards the end I worked two days a week, and I still had time to have a life. Mm -hmm. And I could take off whenever I had a new grandchild born or something, you know. Mm -hmm. It was nice. It was a good career for me. And you could do all the teeth of all your grandchildren. Oh, yes. And I, and I made a lot of good friends in the dental office. It was a fun, a fun thing to do. That's great. Um, Tell me about your uh, your holidays, your favorite holidays, uh, what you enjoy most about, about holidays. Well, growing up, my mom and dad made holidays really special, and Thanksgiving and Christmas and all the family came, and so we've kind of carried on that tradition, and we love having you come for Thanksgiving, and we always have the family Christmas party like mother and dad put on, and it, dad played Santa, and it was just really fun. Now David's our favorite Santa. He is such a ho-ho. <laughs> Isn't he cute? Yeah. He does a good job. We love going to your house. Now that we're grandparents, we go to your house in the morning, and then we go to Daryl and Louise's house in the morning. Er, 
Carolyn, Carolyn David. Davids, and it's just fun to be with family. That's great. Um, what is your favorite holiday food? Mm. Ice cream, of course. <laughs> My mom and dad used to make homemade ice cream. Mm -hmm. And at first, Dad had this kind of a freezer, and then we got an electric one, and it's just special. Your mom makes good homemade ice cream. She does make We need to make, make her make it more often. Uh-huh. That's great. Um, tell me, let's see, we have a list here, and I don't know which ones have already been asked. None of those have. Oh, they haven't? Mm -mm. Okay. Um, tell me about uh, your marriage to Grandpa Hanson. Maybe starting out as, as where you met or? Well, we met through his sister, Julie, because Julie and I were good friends at the BYU. And Bob was away at war, and he came home and started into dental school. And um, Julie was kind of going this way to him, to every one of her girlfriends. <laughs> and, and it clicked with Bob and me. We had, we had a good time. We went to uh, Lake, we, we came up here and we're married in the Salt Lake Temple in Salt Lake, and then we went to Lake Tahoe and, and uh, San Francisco and down the coast on our honeymoon, and then we had a wedding reception in Long Beach at my parents' home a week after we were married. Oh, nice. Then we had a little apartment in, in uh, Los Angeles, very near uh, the Coliseum, where they play football, and um, that's where we lived when Sue was born. And uh, then we lived in, in La Cunada after two years of marriage, and then he graduated, and we moved to La Cunada and lived there the rest of the time. How did you choose La Cunada? Well, Bob had kind of grown up in Glendale part of the time, and so he knew the area, and he knew that La Cunada was a really nice community, mm -hmm. full of well-educated people, good schools, nice people to live with, mm -hmm. and we really enjoyed it there. Our girls got a good education, a good start, and wonderful people. Whether they were LDS or not, they were all interested in families. They showed up for all the plays and parades and everything, and mm -hmm. we had a good time. Um, my mom tells me lots of stories of uh, summers spent at Lake Arrowhead. Mm, yes. <laughs> Tell me about some of the activities that you would do there and, and the time that you'd spend there. We bought a little cabin at Lake Arrowhead, and we'd walk down the street and down a lot to get to our dock. Well, pretty soon, we bought the lot and built the house there. The cabin, we called it, but it was a beautiful A-frame home beautiful wood interior, and we had our boat, and we, we named it Sukaloo for Sue, Carol, and Louise. And so that was just wonderful to water ski and, and spend holidays together there. We were together as a family a lot because of the cabin. We loved it. How far was the drive for you? About an hour and a half. Oh, that's not bad mm -hmm. at all. So you'd go and spend the entire summers there. Uh-huh, we did. Mom tells me she spent the entire summer sewing. That was her most favorite pastime. We did a lot of sewing there. We had a, pig, a ping pong table in the downstairs, and we'd use that as the cutting. And at first, I did all the sewing, and they did the other things. Tell me how you, uh, how you uh, arrived at your association with the Anderson family. Well, they moved in up there. Uh, he was going to be a dentist in, in practice at Lake Arrowhead, and they needed a place to stay, and it was summertime, and they couldn't rent anything. Everything was rented, and we said, come and stay with us. We met them at church. Oh, that's great. And so they stayed with us uh, two or three months until the uh, fall came, and they could rent a house, and then they bought one eventually. Uh -huh. and they're dear friends. Grandma, Thank you. I love you to pieces. Mm -hmm. Love you, too. You're dear. This is my daughter Louise, number three child, love her to pieces. Mom, what was your favorite saying? Well, I think it's a scripture, and it's, uh, don't ask me what the chapter and number is, but it's, there is a law irrevocably decreed before the foundations of the earth upon which all blessings are predicated, and it is by obedience to this law that we receive the blessings. And so when I've had questions and problems in my life, I've thought, well, what's the law I'm supposed to be living to get the blessing that I want? And it's been really helpful to me in many ways to straighten me up and, and to help me go forward, and I have been so blessed, very blessed. What's your favorite book? Well, it has to be the scriptures. And I just keep reading them over and over, and I've challenged the women in my Relief Society this year to read the Doctrine and Covenants. Last year we read the Book of Mormon and 
afterwards. Each year we have a dinner here at my home for all the sisters who've read them. Being an English major in college, what would be your favorite book other than the scriptures? Hmm. I know as a child you always talked about Shakespeare and stuff, but other than that? Shakespeare has to be one of the favorites, yes. Lots of wisdom in Shakespeare. My, I said earlier, I think, that my father quoted that to me when I went away to college. Never a borrower nor a lender be. <laughs> Good things like that. Good. Um, what was your first talk that you ever gave him as a child? This was in primary, and in, the, in those days we had primary in the afternoon, and in Long Beach my mother was the very first primary president. They hadn't had primary till she came along and organized this and asked her to be the first president. And, and we had a little memory gym that some of, one of the students gave at the beginning of the, of the primary. And so Mother had trained me very well to say, when I wake up in the morning all ready for work and for play, I hope I can be a good little sunbeam today. So she rehearsed me very well on that. And when I got there and they called on me, I stood up and sang, show me the way to go home. I'm tired and I want to go to bed. I had a little drink about an hour ago and it went right to my head on land or sea or foam, wherever I may roam. You can always hear me singing this song, show me the way to go home. And my mother nearly died. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's enough. <laughs> Thanks so much, sweetheart. Well, wait, I have one more thing oh. I want you to tell. As, as our family, and I know I've talked with Carol and Susie, too, you always um, sang uh, in the morning to us to get out of bed. And then we've sang it to our children as well. Do you remember it? Oh, my. Rehearse me. Good, good morning to you. Good, good morning, morning to you. We're all in our places and high family spaces. Good this is the that day to start a good day. day. Yes. <laughs> I'd forgotten that one. I haven't sung it in a long time. Well, I think we needed that one on tape so we could remember that Good. one. Good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Love you to pieces. Love you too. Mm -hmm. Hi, this is my lovely granddaughter, Rachel. Rachel Mills now, married. Love you. Fun to have you here. Grandma, tell us about when you had your skiing accident at the, at the Laguna Beach. Oh, it was at Newport Beach. Newport Beach. Yeah. We were skiing in Newport Bay down there. I was the young women's leader and uh, had a bunch of girls with me. And I loved to water ski, but we'd always done our water skiing at Lake Arrowhead, except when we first learned in Mexico. And so I came in off my ski around and went zooming into the shore, and I didn't realize how shallow it was. Mm -hmm. And the skag of the ski hit the sand, and I was still going head on, and whoa. And I'd seen somebody at another lake one time break their neck. And so I thought, I don't want to do that. No. And so I ducked down really far. Did you do a flip? I did a flip, a complete flip. And do you know what I broke? My sternum. Really? Can you get your chin down to your sternum? No, I That's think. a long, hard... <laughs> but I did, and I broke my sternum with the... And fortunately, you know, the Lord blesses you when you're on LDS outings. <laughs> <laughs> he had a doctor aboard, and the doctor took me to the hospital, and he knew what to, how to take care of me and kept asking me if he had any numbness or anything, and I didn't, and I came through it just beautifully. But it was kind of scary. Well, good. Well, speaking of accidents, have you ever been in an automobile accident? Just once. Um, I was going to the BYU, and my mother was a Stake Relief Society president, and she had two other ladies with her, and she was driving up to October Conference, and it was time for me to start school at the Y, so I was in the car with them. We came from Long Beach, and we spent the night in a little town, Beaver, I think, and then we started out early the next morning, not realizing that it was kind of skiddy and wet and sleet mm -hmm. and icy, and but it was so cold when... When I uh, got in the car, Mother said, why don't you sit in the back seat between those two ladies who were very portly? <laughs> and Mother was in the front seat, and this was, and it was such a crash, nobody thought there'd be anybody alive. Oh but the thing that saved us was that we were all crowded in the back seat as though we had seat belts on, and Mother had the steering wheel. She was a little portly, too, and that wedged her in. And so, again, we were saved. It was really wonderful. Well, good. I know one of your I know one of your favorite hobbies. Well, 
you tell me what your favorite hobby, and I'll tell you if it's the same one I have in mind. Ken said, how come we have this cross jigsaw puzzle out here? <laughs> well, we just almost always have a jigsaw puzzle on this table. It's wonderful, and we love doing them. Okay. And, of course, of I love crossword puzzles. That's the one I thought. When the uh, Tribune came today, there's usually two puzzles in there, and so I made a copy of each one and put them in your mom's suitcase so that <laughs> she could work them on her way home to Palo Alto tonight. Oh, Grandma. <laughs> Goodbye, Grandma. Goodbye. Love you. Love you, too. This is Brandon Mills, my favorite grandson-in-law. <laughs> He's married <laughs> so to Rachel. So far, so good, right? <laughs> <laughs> Love you. Well, um, this is a great opportunity to uh, sit down with you and Thank you. chat about different events of your life. And uh, there's a couple of questions we have here. Um, um, what did you do at high school graduation, and did you give a talk, or um, how did you participate? I graduated from Woodrow Wilson High School, 1944, and they had us uh, try out for graduation speakers, but there were all these wonderful Jewish kids in my school, and they are so sharp and so agile with their words, and uh, Four of them were uh, selected to be graduation speakers, but they asked me to speak at the Vespers service, which was the Sunday thing. They had uh, kind of religious things with school in those days. Mm -hmm. And so since World War II was on, I gave a talk about uh, Isaiah 2 and 2, and they shall turn their swords into plowshares and war no more. And mm. uh, they kind of chose me because I was a good Christian, and, and that was my topic. This is Carly High. She's Louise's youngest daughter. Fun to have you here, Carly. It's good to be here. Um, I wanted to ask how the church, how you remember the Depression and how the church was affiliated with that and what they did to what their organization was with the families who were in need. The Great Depression came in 1933, and I was uh, six years old. We lived in our new house on uh, 533 Orlina Avenue. Um, my father was an electrical contractor, as I've said, but he didn't have any work. He had no work. And he would say to us, if the phone rings, and it's anybody at all, get their name and phone number so I can call them back. Because if they even wanted a little switch plate replaced, it meant that little amount of money to him. And so he wanted every bit of job he could have. Uh, he had a lot of spare time, and so he planted a garden. And we had wonderful tomatoes and peas and beans and all the things like that. And uh, I grew up shelling peas. <laughs> you don't do that anymore. You buy them frozen. But um, we always had food. Sometimes at the dinner table at night, there'd be mother and dad and four children and grandma, and we'd have a bottle of tomatoes that mother had canned, and we'd have a bottle of peaches and maybe some bread and milk. And that was dinner. Because there was no work, there was no money to buy food. But we never went hungry. We were always provided for. There were a lot of people who would come to our door begging for food. And Mother would always give them something. She never gave them money because we didn't have any extra money. But she never turned them away, even if it was a piece of bread, and I can remember them sitting on our back step eating. She was really good to them. Mother was the Relief Society president at the time, and often we would go to the store and buy things and distribute to the people who were in need, and the church would reimburse her. Then uh, Elder Harold B. Lee, who subsequently became the president of the church, but at that time he was an apostle, and he came to Southern California, and he taught all of the Stake Relief Society presidents, and Mother was one of those. I think there were only eight stakes in all of California at that time. And they all gathered together, and Elder Lee taught them the welfare program. And uh, 
So then that was instigated and mother could write food orders and the people could go to the welfare centers and get the food that they needed. But very often I would go to with mother to make visits. And one time I can remember going to a hospital with her and a little boy who wasn't much taller than I was r- spotted mother and he ran the whole distance of the hallway and threw his arms around her knees. That's how short he was. And he looked up at her and said, Oh, Sister Minor, don't let my mommy die. And I knew that Mother was on an angel's mission at that time, caring for those who were really in need. One time we went to a home when they had absolutely no furniture. And that was a new thing for me. I'd never been in a house with absolutely no furniture when people were living there. So there were a lot of eye-openers. As I got older in high school and Mother needed somebody to staff the Deseret Industries, which was a very small shop in Long Beach, Mary Jane will go and take over on Saturday, you know, (laughs) this kind of thing. But um, the church's program was inspired, and now as Relief Society president, I'm involved in the welfare program. And we have assignments to go out to the cannery or the or the dairy and and uh, help to pre- preserve the food items there, and uh, and then I go and meet with people who are in need and fill out food orders for them so that they can go to the the various um, welfare square places and and get the food that they need. It's a wonderful program. It's a wonderful program. But one of the things that helps it is our fast offerings. And a year ago, our bishop said, fast offering is part of the law of consecration. And if it, you're not giving till it hurts, you're not giving enough. And so he asked each of us who could, some can't, but he said, all of you who can, please double your fast offerings this year. So Grandpa and I decided to do that. And we haven't missed it. And we feel good about it because it's going to those who need it. And you read the newspapers and this, if there's something going on in Kosovo or a, Florida has a flood or a, a hurricane or something, the church boxes up these bales of things and air flights them over there. Within hours, those people are taken care of. It doesn't matter whether they're members of the church or not. It's a wonderful program. And I love being a part of it. Um, the other question I wanted to ask you was, when you're in high school, what do you remember your testimony being? What do you remember the strengths of your testimony being, as well as your weaknesses as far as your testimony when you were a teenager? Or? I can remember bearing my testimony. I can remember one time in state conference they asked me, without any notice, to bear my testimony. <laughs> And after it was over, one of my friends said, that was really good, Mary Jane. I'll I'll be anxious to hear the rest of it sometime. So I guess it was short. (laughs) But I remember having a date with a return missionary one time, and I said to him, what does it mean to fear God? Somehow those two didn't connect with me. I loved God. I loved the Savior. But fear wasn't a part of that. And then he explained to me that to fear God is to, is to want to keep his commandments and to live the way he wants us to live. But to not, not live in fear is the way we know it, but, but more in awe and obedience. Okay. Thank you so much for coming. You're a sweetheart. Proud of you and all the things you're doing.